Whenever you're ready, we're recording. Morning, Ed. Uh, I understand uh, you're going to be overseas uh, in late June when the ANS meeting is going to happen in Chicago. I'm delighted at this opportunity to receive your message for the ANS members regarding uh, low-level radiation health effects. We're interested in the implication of the scientific information on the people living around the Fukushima nuclear plant who were evacuated uh, last March. You wrote a remarkable paper in 2009 about the road to linearity, how radiation protection went from a safe dose limit to the linear no threshold uh, notion of uh, risk of cancer and genetic effects. And last year you looked into Herman Muller's discovery of radiation induced mutations in fruit flies and his Nobel Prize speech in 1946, where he said there is no escape from linearity all the way down to zero dose. So uh, I appreciate uh, your views on this. Well, the, <clears throat> the issue of uh, the dose response is central to toxicology and the driver in risk assessment. And what I did in the Road to Linearity paper was to try to reconstruct the history of the dose response as pertains to uh, the carcinogen linearity um, protocol assumptions and, and modeling. And then I actually followed up on that with a, uh, a, a more extensive, uh, broader look at the dose response relationship in a subsequently uh, published paper in 2011. However, when I was putting that uh, subsequent paper together, I um, was at a near final stage. And so I sent this manuscript out to approximately a dozen scientists for what I'd call critical friendly reviews. Uh, one of the scientists happened to be a very prominent um, a geneticist. Um, and he uh, has a very excellent understanding of the history of uh, mutation and dose response and is a um, very critical person in terms of everything that I sent him to read. And so he, as he read over my uh, draft manuscript, he told me that I um, had not done a sufficiently adequate job on evaluating the impact of Herman Muller's uh, research on the, uh, the impact of the dose response. And not that he necessarily knew what it was, but he just had this intuition that I didn't go into sufficient detail. And so upon reflection, I agreed with, with this and actually delayed um, completion of the manuscript by probably uh, six months or more uh, since I had to go back into Muller's work and reread um, many uh, or most of his uh, published works. I reread a biography uh, of him. Um, and, and so I um, began to, to fill things in. And in the course of it, I, uh, he became progressively more interesting to me. And I realized that just what was in the peer-reviewed published literature and the biography wasn't really uh, getting to, um, to root everything out. And so I, I realized that, that, in fact, that uh, there was a copious, uh, what I'd call open but somewhat gray literature that's contained in um, many of his uh, correspondences with scientists around the world. And, um, to, and to family members and to, and to others and uh, just many, um, many pieces of literature that would pro probably be normally called gray. And so they exist, but they're hard to find or you have to know where, where to look for them. And so in the course of this, I uh, uncovered that, uh, in fact, um, uh, Dr. Muller uh, was uh, living in my town, Amherst, Massachusetts, uh, from 1940-ish through uh, the completion of World War II. And uh, during that time, he became a consultant uh, to the University of Rochester in uh, funded research uh, by the uh, Manhattan Project, and this was under the aegis of a professor, a uh, very well-known geneticist by the name of Kurt Stern. And Stern um, basically got permission 
from Mueller to be a, a paid consultant, and Mueller was a, somewhat of a controversial figure at the time because uh, Mueller had uh, left the U.S. in the early 1930s and ultimately migrated to, uh, to the Soviet Union, had some sort of an intellectual, passionate love affair with uh, um, the idea of the Soviet Union, conducted much research over there and ultimately escaped with his life and uh, rejected uh, the system of government that he, uh, um, that he went to live with, went to the University of Edinburgh, and ultimately um, came back to the States, but was fortunate to uh, essentially get a job at Amherst College, which uh, offered him a position because most of their faculty uh, were being drafted into World War II. So Muller was, was here and filling in a teaching uh, role, but also conducting research, and ultimately linked up with the University of Rochester and his good old friend, um, um, Kurt Stern. And in fact, just as a little aside, um, the relationship with Stern goes way back to when he actually uh, first presented the data behind his Nobel Prize work, which was in the fall of, of 1927, because uh, when uh, Mueller um, took the boat over to uh, to Germany, uh, he really hadn't completed writing his manuscript. And it was actually Kurt Stern's mom that typed his manuscript prior to his actual presentation at the uh, genetics uh, conference where his Nobel Prize research was first presented. Uh, the, the research supporting the Nobel Prize um, was first presented. Well, as it turns out, um, the Manhattan Project was really uh, setting forth with a goal to try to understand the nature of the dose response in the low dose zone for ionizing radiation. And they had two funded uh, major areas. One was in the area of um, mammalian research, uh, and the other was uh, using an insect model, uh, the fruit fly. The uh, mammalian research um, actually never went um, in a productive direction. The, uh, even though they had used um, more than a quarter of a million mice in this study. Uh, there was never a, a detailed paper that came forth that was published. There was a summary paper published uh, during the latter uh, years of the, uh, the, the, the principal investigator, Dr. Charles, who then subsequently died of uh, uh, leukemia. And, and, and then there was uh, Charles's group, uh, four or five years later, published another uh, limited summary and, and essentially, all those data were, that underlied this um, major effort were never utilized in a dose-response fashion. But the research of uh, Kurt Stern was. And Stern is essentially, you know, if you really, I mean, even though 250,000 or more mice sounds, sounds significant, in the case of fruit flies, I've heard people refer to the Kurt Stern research as research that was um, essentially using 30 million flies. And, you know, can 30 million flies be wrong? And so, well, as it turns out, um, um, two types of research uh, projects were to be done. One was an acute study, short-term study to uh, ionizing radiation uh, in the form of x-rays. And then th there was a follow-up study, which was a uh, chronic study uh, in the fruit fly, which means that uh, it was only a a 21-day study. The acute study was in the form of an exposure over minutes um, as compared to 21 days. The 21-day study was ionizing radiation, but it was with gamma rays. And so uh, in the initial study, um, there was, with, with the acute uh, high dose, a short term, um, there was an apparent uh, linear dose response relationship. Uh, the follow-up work was undertaken by um, um, a person by the name of Ernst Kasperi. And Kasperi um, was a very experienced uh, behavioral entomologist uh, who had migrated from Germany, ultimately making his way to Rochester. And in this uh, study, uh, he was um, um, basically following the protocols which had been established prior uh, by the prior investigators. However, there were some upgrades in the, uh, in the methodology as a result of um, essentially what they learned from the past two years' work. Well, 
When Kasperi finally completed his, his, his research, which was in August of 1946, um, Kurt Stern, Kasperi, and others were expecting that he would reaffirm um, the basic belief that there would be a linear dose-response relationship. And to um, essentially Kasperi's shock and surprise, the data didn't support that. It actually supported what appeared to him to be a threshold dose-response relationship. So he, of course, shares his findings with his uh, supervisor, which is Kurt Stern. And Stern is, um, is not pleased with what he sees. He, in fact, was fully expecting, and in fact, I believe was hoping to see support for a low-dose linear relationship. He, in fact, asserted um, to, um, to Kasperi that the reason why uh, there appeared to be a threshold was, in fact, because there was a problem with his research. And the problem with his research was that his control group was acting in an aberrant fashion, that his control group must be, must be showing an elevated, um, uh, an elevated background mutational uh, rate. And so he said, uh, if it, in fact, it had been acting normally, we would have actually seen this, this support for linearity. So I don't accept your work. And so Kasperi dug in. And Kasperi wanted to see, well, was he right or was he wrong? And so Kasperi dug deep into the literature. He actually got uh, uh, much unpublished data from Muller himself. And when he combined the published and the unpublished work, he actually was able to show that his control group was actually responding in the way that um, was consistent with all the other reported findings. And so he goes back to, um, goes back to Stern and he says, I think you're wrong. And basically he gets Stern to back down and uh, the paper gets, uh, the manuscript gets written with uh, the statement and the conclusion that there was support for uh, a threshold relationship, what they called a tolerance level. And so what happened was that since uh, um, Muller was, uh, was a consultant, um, one might think that, in fact, uh, he would be observing this going th through this whole process. In fact, uh, the strain uh, of, of um, Drosophila that they used was actually the Muller 5 strain. He provided them uh, with that during this. Well, at this point in my own research, I don't know whether Muller's seen these data or not. I just know that this study now had been completed and that Muller had gone to, um, to Stockholm to receive his Nobel Prize in December of 1946. And, but, and I had read and studied Muller's uh, Nobel Prize uh, speech, um, his Nobel Prize lecture, which was given on December 12, um, 1946. And in, that, um, in the middle of that uh, speech, he uh, has several paragraphs in which he addresses the issue of dose response. And for reasons that are hard for me to understand within the context of his total speech, he, he basically makes the claim that one can no longer accept um, um, the belief that there is a threshold relationship which describes uh, how ionizing radiation would affect biological endpoints, including mutation. And he goes beyond that. He, he says that you know, we have to accept a linear perspective. And he's very, very forceful in this. And so I'm, I'm getting curious at this point. I'm saying, well, 